Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Wahda la sharika Allah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, we're going to talk about preparing our hearts for Ramadan. And Ramadan could be tomorrow for all we know. So, inshallah, we still have the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, allows us to make it, inshallah, to Ramadan because we aren't promised tomorrow. So tonight, let's try to start making sure our hearts are prepared for Ramadan, not just um, our, our, our pantries, not just our um, bodies. Everything is ready for Ramadan, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. And again, it may not be, subhanAllah, that... Um, Okay. Okay, let me see if this is working. It is. Alhamdulillah, I was able to do this PowerPoint as the background, but how do I get the PowerPoint to, oh, there it is. There we go. I couldn't figure out how to get it to move. Now, to begin with, remember, everything that I'm teaching you here today can be utilized even after Ramadan. It's not just something um, for Ramadan and it's not something just for preparing. During Ramadan, we can think about, utilize, work on these aspects of our heart. So we begin by talking about isti'an, um, which is seeking help from Allah. Now, what is this? This is when anything that's going on, like right now, we're getting ready for Ramadan. Ask a lot to help you in Ramadan. Ask a lot to help you to be better at fasting, help you to be better at not backbiting, help you to be better at staying away from things that are difficult, that are haram. Ask a lot for help. We're getting ready to spend an entire month of worshiping Allah, of fasting for the sake of Allah, of doing everything for the sake of Allah, Start out by asking Allah to help you. Asking Allah to make it easy. Asking Allah to increase your barakah. Asking Allah to help you to get forgiveness. Asking Allah for anything and everything that we need as a part of being Muslims in Ramadan. Because it isn't easy. It's not something that you wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, it's Ramadan, let me fast. No, it's not easy. It's something that we have to commit ourselves to. And we start our commitment with our heart. And our heart has to turn to Allah. Our heart, our heart has to accept that we cannot have a cleaner heart, a purer heart, a better heart without the help of Allah. So let us begin with asking Allah to help us. We make our intention, I want to do this for the sake of Allah. And Allah, help me to do that. Allah, keep me strong in doing that. Oh, Allah, give me what I need of your support so that I can worship you in the best way possible. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now, one of the ways to do this is we make tawbah. What is tawbah? Tawbah is a sincere repentance to Allah for everything that we have done this year and every year before it. Think hard, reflect on what it was that we have done that is wrong within the last year. From last Ramadan to this Ramadan, ask Allah to forgive us. If we've been doing wrong for a lot longer than that, ask Allah, oh Allah, number one, I'm asking for your help to stay away from this haram that I've been doing. Oh Allah, I'm asking you to forgive me. Start Ramadan with a begging for forgiveness, a begging for Allah to help you, a begging for Allah to keep you on the straight path to make you a better Muslim. So start out with what? With tawbah. And how do we make tawbah? Of course, the first thing we do is that we find sincerity in our heart. We recognize that the rights of Allah are greater than our own rights. That what we've done is haram. That Allah has forbidden what it is that we've done. Then we make a sincere begging to Allah to forgive us for that thing. Then if we have to make amends, we make amends. And we try our best to never do it again. And not just try our best to never do it again. If you're doing something wrong, 
Put roadblocks in your way. Add a way to stop yourself from doing it. May a'udhu billah, you have a boyfriend. A'udhu billah. And it's something you know is haram. And you are weak and you've done something. Ask Allah to forgive you. Cut off this relationship. To the best of your ability, cut it. But don't just say, I'm cutting it. Delete the number. Block the number, then delete it. Make sure. Change your phone. Change your phone number. What can you do to stop yourself from the haram? Make the steps. You're drinking. Throw away the alcohol. Make sure it's not in the house. Stop yourself in any way or sh shape or form from access to the, the alcohol that you are doing. Whatever your haram happens to be, and I'm using major ones, minor ones, major ones, any haram that we're doing, let's put some roadblocks. And try your best to never go back to it. And if you fall, ask Allah for forgiveness and start all over again. Start your process all over again. And may Allah make it easy for us to have sincere tawbah tonight. Tonight, we work on it. We put our face to the ground and say, Allah, forgive me with every ounce of belief and faith in your heart that Allah is ar-Rahman, that Allah is ar-Rahim. And try to start over today. Every day that we are alive is a new day to start over. Let's take advantage of this. Let's clean our heart from the sin that we're doing and ask Allah to forgive us for it. Subhana Allah. We have to work on training ourselves. Train ourselves to seek help with Allah. Subhana wa ta'ala. And the small matters and in the big ones. In small matters, in big ones, we try to train ourselves to always go to Allah first. It's not haram to ask people for help. And there is goodness in asking people for help because we're giving them the barakah of helping us. <coughs> Excuse me. But added to this, we need to make sure that the one that's allowing them to help us. The one that is putting them in the path and giving them the barakah is Allah. So let's train ourselves to always count on Allah, call on Allah, trust Allah, know that Allah is the source of all help. Every day we stand up to pray. We say, It's you we ask for assistance. It's you that we ask for help. Are we internalizing that? Are we training ourselves to call on Allah first? And if we have to get help from someone else, that we recognize that Allah is giving them that ability. It's a barakah Allah is giving to them to help us. It's all from Allah. And it's to him that we need to go to get help. Now recognize also and notice our weaknesses. Notice that you have weak points and the places where you lack your seeking of, of, of help from Allah. Your lack of ability to stay away from your weaknesses. Your lack of uh, faith in Allah. When something happens, when something goes wrong, do we recognize this is from Allah? This is a weakness we all have. I literally have to sometimes stop myself. Stop. Whatever it is that's happening, this horrible, horrible event has happened in my life. I lost all my money. I lost my child. I lost my home. Um, my child is committing haram. My husband is horrible to me. My mother is not a Muslim. My, 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 whatever our problem happens to be. When the problem hits, stop. I literally stop and tell myself, oh Allah, where's the good in this? Oh, Allah, help me be strong with this. Out loud to myself. We all have coping techniques. We all have ways that we make ourselves so that we can be better at it, that we can deal with something. What is your best coping technique? I want you to realize I have this weakness. I need help in this weakness, so I'm going to ask Allah. And two, I have a problem. I'm going to ask Allah. I'm going to ask Allah to help me with whatever the problem is. And when that problem persists, I cannot get out of this situation, whatever this situation happens to be, 
I need to put my trust in Allah. This is a weakness we all have, that we lose trust in Allah. We fail to recognize that everything is with Allah, from Allah, for our good. I'm sick. It's good for me. I lost my home. It's good for me. I lost somebody I loved. It's good for me. I'm married. I'm divorced. It's good for me. It's all good for me because I trust Allah. Allah does not send me something that I can't handle. And Allah does not bring bad to me. He brings something that I perceive to be bad. Train your heart. Notice the weaknesses that you have. I notice the weakness I have and I try to work upon it. I think about it. I reflect on it. I try to talk myself out of my problems by letting myself remember that it's all with Allah. The help is with Allah. The problem is from Allah. It's all with Allah and there's always good in it for me. And what is that good? I need to find it. I need to locate the good in it. Another thing that I need to learn to do is to keep a present heart. What's a present heart? When I'm concentrating on seeking help from Allah with a present heart, that means that my heart is with Allah. My, my heart is thinking about Allah. I'm thinking about the problem and how this fits into the plan of Allah. I don't always know the answer. Actually, most of the time, I have no clue why this is happening. I don't know why I'm sick. I don't know why I'm hurt. I don't know why this problem keeps hitting me. I don't know why I'm broke. I don't know why I'm losing this. I don't know why I lost this person. I don't know. But I do know that Allah is with us, his knowledge, his, his, his mercy, his love. Allah is al-wadud. He is the most loving. Allah is al-Rahman, the most merciful. Is my heart understanding this when I'm getting ready to enter Ramadan with all my problems, with all of my issues, with all of my weaknesses, am I concentrating on the fact that Allah is al-Rahman and he gave me Ramadan for a reason? Because Allah gave it to me and he gave it to you. It's a gift. It's a gift where you have doors of mercy wide open. It's a gift where I have the mercy of Allah available to me all and all the time and in every way. Am I concentrating on this? Is my heart present in the moment? I am fasting. Is my heart present in the moment of fasting? Am I thinking about my fast? Am I thinking about how I can increase this month in terms of blessings? Am I present? SubhanAllah, the children are crying. I need to feed my husband. I have to finish this assignment. I have to do a proposal for my work. I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. There's a million things I have to do. But am I present, not in my work, not in my family, not in my home, not in my cooking, not in the other things that take us away from the remembrance of Allah, but am I present in the worship of Allah? Am I? Is my heart present? Because even those things that I'm doing, I'm washing dishes and I'm getting dinner together so that we can have a nice iftar as a family. While I'm doing that, Am I making dhikr? You know, you could be cooking and as you stir the pot, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar. Am I present in my worship of Allah? Yes. I am cooking this for the sake of Allah. Not just to feed my family, to feed my family breaking their fast so that I can have the barakah of breaking somebody's fast. Am I present in my worship? And recognizing that every single act that I do from the time I open my eyes to the time I close them to go to sleep is an act of worship. Am I present in Ramadan? 
You can work on it today. You can work on it, inshallah, tomorrow. And you can work on it throughout Ramadan. And then when Ramadan is over, you work on it some more. Until we die. Trying to understand, trying to recognize, trying to see that everything is an act of worship. Ramadan is a very special time. And I'm sure many of you have already been listening to articles and listening to, I'm sorry, listening to videos, listening to speakers, preparing you for Ramadan, inshallah. And if you haven't, alhamdulillah, start now. What can I do while I am cooking? Maybe I cannot be 100% listening to somebody's lecture. Not 100%. But if I have the lecture on and I can hear it, if I gain one tiny little ounce of knowledge while I'm cooking, while I'm cleaning, while I'm preparing things for my family, while I'm doing my work, then I have gained something I didn't have a few minutes ago. Now, in Ramadan, a lot of us, we burn out because we try to do too much. I don't want you to do too much. I want you to get not so much quantity, as quality. I want you to think about I am building my heart to make myself a stronger Muslim because the, the, the beginning of Islam is in the heart. You have to accept and we accept in our heart. We have to trust and we trust with our heart. We have to recognize Allah and we have to clean ourselves from those things that keep us away from Allah. We have to do that because I'm praying and I'm fasting and I'm doing all the other things. I'm reading Quran five times in one month. Masha Allah. But my heart is sick. My trust is not with Allah. My worries are not with Allah. When things happen, I am not thinking, oh, Allah, help me. I'm thinking, how am I going to fix this? Keep yourself present. In your worship of Allah, your trust of Allah, your, your knowledge of the mercy of Allah. And increase yourself and clean your heart before, during, and after Ramadan. Subhana Allah. Now, one of the ways to do this is to chain your desires. Every human being is a slave. You're either a slave, slave of your desire or a slave of Allah. You either live life by your rules or by the rules of Allah. O son of Adam, sell this world for the hereafter, and you will win both. Sell the hereafter for this world, and you will lose both of them. Subhanallah. This was, this was stated by Ibn al-Qayyim. Allah have mercy on him. Are we selling our souls to the dunya? Or are we selling our souls to the akhirah? Who are we worshipping? Are we worshipping Allah or our desires? And how do I know what I'm doing? How do I know that I am putting myself after my desires? Well, most of the time we know when we do something wrong, we recognize, oh no, I'm doing something wrong. This is haram. But when we look at things, are we looking at every single aspect of our life? Everything. Again, from opening my eyes, am I looking at everything with an Islamic ruler? Is this halal? Is this haram? Is this bringing me barakah or is this bringing me sin? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Is this correct? Is this ordained by Allah? How can I increase what I'm doing without overwhelming myself? Because this is also important. Islam is balance. Again, we burn out sometimes by the end of Ramadan because we're trying to do too much. What I want us to focus on is making ourselves a better slave of Allah. Making ourselves a better Muslim. Muslim, submitter to Allah. When you do something, ask yourself, am I submitting to Allah or am I submitting to my desire? The haram police comes up to me. And says, sister, haram to listen to music. And most of us are like, uh, maybe it's haram. 
Maybe it's not haram. I'm not 100% sure. So I'm going to listen to it sometimes. Most Muslims are in this stage. But Ramadan comes along. No music. No dancing. No this, no that. You cut off a lot of things in Ramadan. So in essence, you're saying, I know that this is wrong. Because if it was wrong in Ramadan, it's also wrong out of Ramadan. Is it not? If something is wrong in Ramadan, then it's wrong outside of Ramadan. So we have that feeling, that understanding that we shouldn't be doing this thing. So during Ramadan, now we can see whether or not we're following our desires or we're following what? We're following Allah. Who are we following? Are we following Allah or are we following our desires? Also, Ramadan is really good because the Prophet ﷺ, he told us that shaitan is being chained up. So if you are stronger at a lot of things during Ramadan, recognize that part of that is probably you're listening to the whispering of shaitan. It's not just our desires. But if you're still weak at something, that's you. That's me. That's our desires that keep us weak, even in Ramadan. It's not shaitan anymore. We can't blame him. We have to blame ourselves. So let's see how we can chain our desires and make ourselves stronger. And of course, we need to polish our heart. How do you polish our heart? your heart? The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, when a believer sins, there appears a black spot on the, on the heart. And if he repents and asks forgiveness and pardon, his heart is polished. But he, if he does more, it increases until it covers his heart. That is the rust mentioned by Allah Most High. Nay, what they were committing has spread like rust over their heart. So is there rust on our heart? Are we asking for forgiveness? Are we trying to polish our heart? Tawbah is the polish. Nobody's perfect. Every single one of us is going to sin. Every single one of us sins. Every single one of us does things that is wrong. There's no perfect human being on the face of this earth. None of us. But when we commit a sin, when we do something wrong, when we fall, are we begging Allah for forgiveness? Subhana Allah. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is so merciful that the angel's pen is lifted for six hours where he does not write down our sin. Six hours. And if we repent in that time, it's not written. Allah is the most merciful. Are we polishing our hearts? Are we asking Allah for forgiveness? Sisters, if you can start tonight, in the last third of the night, place your head to the floor. Sujood. Make Salat Tawbah. And in your sujood, ask Allah to forgive you and to clean your slate. Ask Allah from here on, hold on to, uh, erase everything that came before it. Allah is capable. He is Ar-Rahman. Beg Allah with the full sincerity for everything that we've done. Tonight, head to the ground. Face on the floor. Cry to your Lord and polish your heart. And begin Ramadan with a polished heart. And inshallah, end it with full forgiveness. Rabia Radiwanhum reported, uh, Abu Darda Radiwanhum said, Verily, everything has a polish, and the polish of the heart is the remembrance of Allah Almighty. So here's another way to polish your heart. Remember Allah. And this isn't just dhikr, simple dhikr. When you make dhikr, 
You're remembering Allah. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. You're making dhikr. And you are remembering Allah. But also remembering Allah means you're planning to do something and you know that thing was wrong and you remember Allah and it stops you from doing that thing that you had intended to do. Remember Allah and ask forgiveness. Remember Allah and ask for help. Allah stop me from this thing that I wanted to do. Remember. When you remember Allah, you realize the nature of your sin. You realize the nature of your weakness. Remember Allah often. A lady that she is now, mashallah, she's grown, she's got children, and I've known her since she was a little girl. And she said that one time she was with a group from her school and they were going to a Broadway show. And when, we were on this, when they were in this Broadway show, she had so desperately wanted to see one. She'd never been to a Broadway show before, and she really wanted to see one. But she said that she was sitting there, and all of a sudden, she remembered something I had said in a class long ago, where I had said that if you die in a place and somebody is committing a haram in that place, you will be raised among them as one of them. And she remembered Allah. And she said the entire show, she doesn't remember much from the show because all she could think of was, oh Allah, don't let me die in this place. Oh Allah, don't let me die in this place. Oh Allah, forgive me. So we can do haram, all of us do it. Every single human being commits haram. But when you remember Allah, even in the midst of the haram, it stops us. It brings us to tawbah. It brings us to what? To polishing our heart and hopefully never repeating that sin. And Allah knows best. Another way that we prepare our heart is we prepare our heart with the Quran. Allah says what means. Indeed, in this revelation from the Lord of the universe which the trusted spirit has carried down to your heart, that you might become one of those who warn others on behalf of Allah. The Quran enters the heart. Not just the reciting of the Quran, because the reciting of Quran is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's so full of barakah. But it's not just the reciting of it. It's not just the reading of it. It has to enter the heart. And in order to enter the heart, there has to be understanding of it. There was a group of people that were found, I'd say a little over 20 years ago. I remember reading about it in a magazine, how there was a group of people in Vietnam on a mountain. These people were Muslims from the time of the Sahaba, or at the least from the first or second generations. And subhanAllah, they knew nothing of Islam. They had a masjid, and in Ramadan, in that masjid, there was one person, he was the sheikh, he was the imam, and his job was to fast for everybody. People sitting in the masjid, smoking and drinking alcohol, while he recited Quran for them, while he prayed for them, while he did the fasting for them. They had lost the understanding and did not even know that these words that they were saying had meanings. Around the world, people have memorized the Quran, and that is an amazing, amazing, beautiful gift from Allah. But how many truly understand what they've memorized? Is it in our hearts? When I say, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, do I understand what that means? Do I understand what is Allah? Who is Allah? What is the, 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 what are the characteristics of Allah? Do I truly understand it? Allah samad. Do I understand that it's only Allah? Do I truly understand it? We were told, subhanAllah, that Omar radiallahu anhum, it took him eight years 
eight years to memorize Bakara. The companions would memorize 10 verses, understand it, and implement it before, before they went on to the next 10. What are we doing? We're reading the Quran in the month of Ramadan and not a single word is entering our heart because we don't understand it. It's beautiful to read Quran and we push ourselves to read it once, twice, three times in Ramadan. We push ourselves and this is, there's barakah in this. But I'm going to tell you sisters, there's more barakah in reading one verse understanding it fully and implementing it than in reading the whole Quran and not understanding it. Because the Quran is meant to be part of our hearts. It's supposed to be a live example for us to teach us how we live our lives, how we worship Allah, how we manage to get through this dunya and to the other side and on the other side finding Jannah. Do we understand the Quran? Are we reading it with understanding? Is there quality in our reading of the Quran? If I manage to read just a small portion of the Quran, but I have in the month of Ramadan, during Ramadan, I have implemented things that I never did before. I have learned and I understand and I'm doing more for the sake of Allah. Is that not better than just and now I finished the whole Quran and I'm good to go because I finished the Quran but I didn't understand a single thing in the Quran it didn't enter my heart it was on my tongue but not in my heart use the Quran to prepare for Ramadan use the Quran to take us through Ramadan use the Quran to take us through our lives understand the Quran. This is very important. It's integral. The Quran is not a book that sits on the shelf for a year. And then we pick it up and we start reading. And you still don't understand a single thing of it. The Quran is the guide for our lives. The Quran is how we are to be as Muslims. Are we reading it? with understanding or are we just parroting it we need to understand it ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين this is the book of allah which there is no doubt in it it is a guidance for the pious you want to clean your heart you want to open your heart you want to prepare your heart for Ramadan? Do you want to prepare your heart during Ramadan? Do you want to prepare your heart for life and for death? Then we need to use the Quran as guidance. And in order to do that, we have to understand it. In the Quran, Allah again and again and again repeats to us, do they not reflect? Do they then not reflect on the Quran or are there locks on their hearts? How often do you just take five minutes, 10 minutes and reflect upon the words of Allah? Think about it. Reflect on your life. And what am I doing to please Allah? Reflect on your family and how am I raising them? to worship Allah. Reflect on your job and how is this getting me closer to Allah? How often do we oft, oh, actually, actually reflect? Are we reflecting? Are we taking time to sit and think? How am I as a slave of Allah? How am I in submitting to Allah? What am I doing to increase my barakah? What am I doing to work on my weaknesses? Am I reflecting or not? Am I thinking about Allah or not? Am I worshiping Allah the way he wants me to worship? 
Or am I worshiping my desires? Somebody comes to you and says, X and Y is haram. One of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that they were sitting and drinking. Subhanallah. They were sitting and drinking alcohol. When the verse came down, Somebody came up to them and said, it is haram to drink. That a verse came forbidding alcohol. And they literally spit it out of their mouths. They didn't question. They didn't say, oh, let me finish this one that's in my mouth and then let me get up and walk over to the Prophet Sallallahu and make sure that what they're saying is true. No, they spit it out of their mouths. Then they went and verified if you're doing something haram, and I don't care how they tell you, they come up to you and they are the most evil, rude, uncouth human being on the face of the earth, and they tell you in the worst way possible, and they humiliate you and they embarrass you when they're doing it. But could what they say be true? If they're saying that what I'm doing is haram, could it be true? Let me go verify. Because if I love Allah, if I believe in Allah, if I want to worship Allah, I need to be sure. What if I'm doing something wrong and I didn't know it? I need to go verify. I go and I check. Now, by verify doesn't mean go to Facebook, open up a group that has a bunch of Muslims in it and say, is it haram to do such and such? Because you're going to get as many opinions as people on Facebook. Go to the sources, the Quran, the Hadith. Go to a scholar of knowledge, a person of knowledge, somebody that you know will give you the correct answer, not the answer you're looking for. I did a whole series on Sheikh shopping. Don't be going around, hey, Sheikh, is this haram? Yes, it's haram. Okay, thank you. Hey, Sheikh number two, is this haram? It's haram. Okay, thank you. Shake number three, is this haram? No, it's not haram. Okay, thank you very much. That's what I'm going to go with. No, that's not what we want to do. Go find the truth. We are so careful. We go through the internet. We contact every doctor we know if we think that we have cancer. We're making absolute certain that we're doing every treatment that we think is the correct way. And we're being very extra careful with our body. But with our spirit, with our heart, how careful are we being? I have cancer, so I'm going to go to Facebook or TikTok or Instagram. And I'm going to ask. I'm going to go to shake Google. And I'm going to ask. And then I'm going to follow the prescription of some random on Facebook. No. I don't know very many human beings who would do that. But am I, with my dean, doing this? Reflect, my sisters. Think about it. Think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Are we worshiping Allah? Are we worshiping our desires? Are we cleaning our heart? Or are we putting black spot after black spot after black spot on there and not worrying about it. Now, Zaid ibn Aslam reported, he was admitted into the home of Abu Dujayna anhum, while he was ill, but his face was joyful. It was said to him, why is your face joyful? And Abu Dujayna said, there is no work more reliable to me than two things, that I do not speak of that which does not concern me, and that my heart is pure towards the Muslims. When we deal with each other, it's so easy. It's so easy to backbite each other. Oh, the Arabs are like this. Oh, the Saudis are like this. Oh, the Desi are like this. The Indians are like this. The Bengali are like that. We're talking about Muslims. And we say bad things about them. We don't stick to that which concerns us. Instead, we're out there backbiting entire nations. Oh, did you see Fulana, so and so? She did X, Y, and Z. It's not your business. 
It's not your business. We need to be careful. We need to think about Allah. Two things. Do not speak of what does not concern me and make your heart pure towards the Muslims. Aren't we supposed to give excuses to our Muslim brothers and sisters? Aren't we supposed to, when we see that they're doing something wrong, give them an excuse and help them? Help them. They are an oppressor. Help to stop them from oppressing. They are committing zinna wisely kindly in the best way that you can help them get away from it instead of telling everybody what they're doing help them how can you help them at the very least you make dua for them asking Allah to guide them asking Allah to make them stop what they're doing to help them subhanallah it is so easy for us to hate each other we make an excuse for a kafir that we don't make for the Muslim. Yeah, a Muslim maybe supposedly knows right from wrong, but maybe they don't. Or maybe they don't understand, or maybe they're weak. It's so easy for us to say, oh, see, I went to America, and in America, everybody was standing in line. And when I go home, it doesn't happen like that. The people are all pushing each other. Oh, when I go to America... I get my rights, but in my country, I don't because all of these Muslims. We talk like that. And we treat each other like that. This is not Islam. Clean your heart. Clean your heart, sisters. Let's clean our hearts. And I am also, I am also part of this. We all do what we shouldn't do. We all say what we shouldn't say, including myself. This is advice to you and to me. Subhanallah. And sisters, Ramadan may be tomorrow. Reconcile. Clean your heart by reconciling. Abdullah ibn Masood reported that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Oh Allah, bring our hearts together, reconcile between us, guide us to ways of peace, and deliver us from the darkness onto light. Reconcile. At least make the attempt. Someone hurts you very badly. Forgive them and make an attempt. Send them the message. I don't, you know, maybe you said or did something in retaliation to what they did to you. Send them a message. May Allah forgive me and you. Let us fix this problem. Sister, this happened between us. Let's try to fix it so that we enter Ramadan, even if they say, no, I want nothing to do with you, drop dead. They give you the worst possible response. You did your duty. You tried. You tried. Help them to be better. And forgive them. And try to reconcile with them. Be they your family, which is, of course, the most important because of you, you're, you're cutting off ties of kinship. Even if you are right a million percent. Even if you're right. One of the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was financially supporting one of the people who back bit Aisha Radiwanha. And he went to the Prophet and said, should I cut him off? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no. Keep the ties of kinship. This man had backbitten and said horrible things about Aisha, anha, who Allah, who Allah defended. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, continue to maintain him because it's kinship. Think about the worst thing that person did to you and forgive it. Think about the best thing they did for you. And use that as a way to push yourself for the sake of Allah to go to them and try to open the ties of kinship. A Muslim brother, a Muslim sister has harmed you. Forgive them and try to reconcile. If they turn you down, it's on them. 
but you do your duty. You do your best. You try your best to be the best Muslim you can. Keep remembering the Akhirah. Ibn al-Mubarak reported Jafar ibn Sulaiman whom said, concern about the world is a darkness in the heart and concern about the hereafter is a light in the heart. So you're preparing for Ramadan? Remember the Akhirah. During Ramadan, remember the Akhirah. Because none of this is worth anything. It's all a stepping stone to get to Jannah. Inshallah, may Allah unite us all in Jannah. Wallah, ameen. Amin. Also, try to learn to be content. Practice it during Ramadan and after. During Ramadan, today, tomorrow, maybe in a week, maybe in a month, something's going to happen to you. Something's going to happen to me. Because trial after trial after trial is always there. What I want you to do is I want you to say to yourself, stop. Stop. Allah sent this to me for a reason. Where is my barakah? I'm happy with whatever Allah sent. I'm going to try my best to accept the will of Allah. Abu Dhar, Radhiwan, whom reported that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, O oh, Abu Dhar, do you say an abundance of possession is wealth? And I said, yes. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, do you say a lack of possessions is poverty? And I said, yes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked this three times and then he said, wealth is the heart, wealth is in the heart and poverty is in the heart. Whoever is wealthy in his heart will not be harmed no matter what happens in the world. Whoever is impoverished in his heart will not be satisfied no matter how much he has in the world. Verily, he will only be harmed by the greed of his own soul. Are you happy with what you have? I have a horrible, horrible, horrible problem. Am I happy with it? Sounds contradictory, right? But if you know that this problem was sent by Allah as a test for you, as a punishment for you, as a whatever for you, then you also have to know that it is a rahma for you. Your trials are a rahma. They're mercy from Allah. Your problems are mercy from Allah. Do you want to be punished in this life or the next? Be content. Do you want to increase yourself your, to, to get rid of sins in this life? Or do you want to go to the next life with those sins? Sometimes a trial is a punishment. Sometimes a trial is a cleansing. Sometimes a trial is a building up so that you become a better Muslim. But always... A trial is rahmah. It's mercy from Allah. Always. Are we content with the trials Allah has sent us? Or are we fighting it tooth and nail? No, I can't handle it. No, I don't want this. Oh, Allah. Why? Why me? Why this? Why now? How are we facing those trials? Subhana Allah. So I'm going to give you some advice on practical things that we can do. Now, one of the things that I do all the time is list. I have tons and tons of lists. These lists are list of my weaknesses, li list of things that I can do to work on each list, on each weakness. So if I know that I'm a backbiter, then I have a list of the kind of things that I backbite about. Then I have another list only on backbiting, how I can fight it, how I can make it myself better on it. I know that I am a person who is not good at waking up for Fedger. I have a, that's part of the list of my weaknesses. So I also have a separate list on that one. How do I work and what can I do to make myself wake up at Fedger? Things that I can, practical things that I can do. Make lists. It doesn't hurt. And this can help you, not everybody. I have alarms for things because my memory is horrible. I literally have an alarm. You know, on the phone, you can do um, an alarm every such and such day. I have an alarm for Asr time, the last hour of Asr for every Friday. Because we get busy. We forget. 
that hour comes and goes and we don't remember it. So I have an alarm for it. It sets every Friday at that time in the last hour. And I have to keep changing it, of course, throughout the year. But it goes dee, 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 dee. It beeps. I look at the alarm. It's like, oh, it's the last hour in Osser on a Friday. And whatever I'm doing, I stop and I make dua. How can you increase your good deeds? List, alarms, your practical time management. Sisters, maybe you have to cook. That's, that's it. Nobody else is going to cook. If you don't cook, there's going to be no food. So work out a schedule that is not overwhelming. Keep that in mind. And during these things, keep within your schedule, keep within your time management that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be cooking at one o'clock. I should be finished by three o'clock. I can warm up the food or I'm going to start cooking. Um, Maghreb is at seven. So I'm going to start cooking at five 30 or six o'clock. It should be ready. And this is what I'm cooking. And I know what I'm cooking tomorrow. And I have a schedule of all the foods that I'm making for this month. Things that are easy, things that are good for my family, things that are healthy, however you want to manage it. But you know that you're supposed to be doing that. At the same time, I want to do more because it is Ramadan. I want to add to it. I'm going to put on this video while I'm cooking. I'm going to put in this video while I'm setting the table. I'm going to have my child sit next to me and help me to, to prepare the dinner, and they're going to be listening to this video as, as well. And again, maybe I'm only getting one sentence from the entire video because my mind is preoccupied with what I'm doing. But that's one sentence I didn't have before, and I'm trying. Make schedules, manage your time, and recognize that the act of cooking itself, if you make the intention correct, is an act of worship. Anything you do that you're doing it for the sake of Allah, it's an act of worship. Prepare your family. Talk to your kids. Talk to your husband. It's Ramadan. What are we going to do? How can we do things for our family? How can we do things um, to, to, to help the community? Make plans with your family. If it's only even if you don't have a spouse that's going to be helpful, make plans with your kids. On Friday, we're going to go and we're going to buy X, Y, and Z and um, dates. We're going to buy bread. We're going to buy uh, water. We're going to buy milk. We're going to buy all these things. And we're going to go out before Ma right before Maghreb. We're going to get in the car. We're going to drive around and we're going to give it to the people that we know have a need. Even once a month you did this. Make preparations with your kids. Let your kids understand the beauty of Islam. While you're cooking, talk to your kids about something, a good Islamic teaching. You're driving your kid to school. You're dropping him off. On the way, tell him a story. And that story has a moral that teaches him something about Islam. Prepare your family. And remember to balance. Remember to keep balance. And let's try to make this a Ramadan of quality. A Ramadan of quality. Increase the quality of what you do by making it come from the heart, by making it understood within the heart, by making the heart on Allah. My heart is focused on Allah. I'm present with the fact that I'm worshiping for Allah. Subhana wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha ant. Wa astaghfiruka wa atubi ilayk.